All right, let's get going. All right, looks like we've had a, a few um, minor technical difficulties, but I think we're uh, getting this all figured out. So welcome everyone to today's um, Connected Conservation webinar on how volunteerism is volunteer is vi vital to conservation. My name is Brian Fainer and I'm with the National Park Service and help support our NPS Connected Conservation Initiative, which focuses on how NPS and partners can work together to improve conservation and connectivity of natural, cultural and recreation resources. Today's webinar is the 11th in a series of how web, of, of webinars on how individuals can help parks and nature. And we're using uh, Microsoft Teams, so uh, thank you for your patience as we adjust uh, to this new uh, uh, webinar interface. Um, there is closed captioning available for those who need it. It's available in the chat. There's a link to um, there for that. We'll also put a link to the uh, Connected Conservation website where you can view past recordings and register for future webinars. And we'll also put a link to that in the chat box. Um, as a reminder, all of our uh, webinars are open to the public, so we encourage you to invite your, your friends and colleagues uh, to future presentations. So let's let me first introduce now um, Sherry Orr, who's with the National Park Service and manages the National Volunteers and Parks Program, which engages hundreds of thousands of volunteers each year in over 400 national park sites. In this role, Sherry provides strategy, vision, and guidance and leads a team that implements national volunteer programs. Prior to journey, joining the NPS, Sherry served in the Peace Corps and was later a senior advisor there. All right, Sherry, over to you. Thanks so much for that intro, Brian, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, great to see some folks that I know and some folks that I don't know on this call. Uh, looking forward to talking more about uh, two big challenges facing us, uh, climate change and biodiversity loss. Uh, both of these require collective and individual action. And one incredible way to do both of those things um, and be involved as an individual and support conservation is as a volunteer. Um, this webinar is actually happening at a perfect time, as you can see um, on this slide. There are actually three events happening this month that tie really well to our themes of conservation and volunteering. Uh, this webinar is a really great opportunity for us to gear up for Earth Day happening on April 22nd. Uh, it's so great because it focuses on how I, as an individual, can make an impact on a big problem, and volunteering is one of many ways to do that. Um, speaking of volunteers, uh, it is National Volunteer Month, uh, all month long uh, in April, and we at the National Park Service particularly welcome na uh, National Volunteer Week and celebrate it later this month. Um, this is a great way for us to celebrate the uh, hundreds of thousands who give their time and talent to the Park Service every year, and this webinar provides a chance to celebrate volunteers and their impact um, all month long. Um, and then conveniently, we're also celebrating National Park Week uh, later this month. National parks are where so much important conservation work takes place. And so talking about how individual volunteers can get involved on public lands and how those National Park staff can help support volunteers is a great way for us to gear up to celebrate National Park Week. Um, at the National Park Service, volunteers are absolutely crucial to our ability to meet our mission, which is to preserve and protect America's special places. Uh, so in this webinar, we'll introduce you to our agency and our volunteer program for those who come from outside the Park Service. And we'll also talk a bit about why people volunteer in the first place and the benefits that they get from volunteering. Uh, and then you'll actually get to hear from NPS rangers in the field and a volunteer about their experience. Uh, these stories from the field will really give you a glimpse in how volunteers are so crucial for conservation efforts at the National Park Service. So here's what we're hoping that you will get out of this webinar. Uh, we're hoping that you will learn a little bit about how the National Park Service is meeting our conservation goals through engaging volunteers. And we're hoping that you'll understand some best practices and resources uh, for either getting involved as a volunteer um, or for using volunteers at your site, whether that's with the National Park Service or one of our many partners in the conservation field. And with that, um, I am actually going to pitch it to Sam, who is going to tell you a little bit more. So Samantha Zerba is the National Volunteer Coordinator with the National Park Service. And Sam is going to give you an, a quick overview of our agency and how we utilize volunteers. Um, and thanks to Sam for organizing today's webinar from our end. I'll pitch it over to you. 
Excellent. Thank you, Sherry. We appreciate you being with us during a busy week. Um, so next, I wanted to speak a little bit about the National Park Service as an agency. Um, thinking about our audience today, we have external and internal folks. So the National Park Service has been around since 1916. Uh, we see over 318 million visitors each year, which is huge. Uh, we have over 420 National Park sites with all types of designations, names that range from National Scenic Trail to Historical Park, National Park, National Monument. Uh, there's really a wide range of sites and parks and programs that we manage. Uh, the National Park Service has around 20,000 employees throughout the service, so I wanted to share that stat with you as well. So we have um, a large workforce of both staff and volunteers. So um, moving on, volunteers were essential in the creation of the National Park Service. It was community members and people like you who care a whole lot, who helped us um, kick off our agency and um, still help us meet our mission today. People like you uh, serve across this country in almost every discipline in the National Park Service as volunteers and staff and engaged community members. Our uh, National Park Service Volunteers in Parks program began in 1970. It was founded by Director George Hartzog. It was enacted by a public law 91-357 in government speak, and um, this law established the program permitting us to engage the service of volunteers in parks. Um, one stipulation of this act was that the service must be mutually beneficial between the National Park Service and the volunteer themselves. And so we honor that today and we still strive to um, create opportunities that are mutually beneficial to the many resources of the National Park Service, as well as to the individual people who give their most valuable resource their time. Um, the goal of our program is to get the work done, but also create these incredible experiences that can be life changing and have many benefits for the, the human behind the service. So uh, we started the program with just a few volunteers, uh, but last year, nearly 124,000 volunteers served, donating over 3.6 million hours. Uh, this is a huge value. If you compare it to a monetary cost estimate developed by the independent sector, that's over $110 million estimated value of service. So um, pretty mind blowing if you think about it, just how much people give. Um, so as I mentioned, every discipline, except for law enforcement, traditional law enforcement duties, uh, just about every discipline, unit, and career field is represented in the Volunteers and Parks program. Uh, we have opportunities available nationwide and in U.S. territories. They're a really critical part of our workforce, um, and we're very grateful for them. Thinking back to pre-pandemic era, the National Park Service engaged over 300,000 volunteers, and that made the VIP program or Volunteers in Parks program the second largest federal workforce following the VA. So if you stop, take a moment and think about that, that is huge. Over 300,000 volunteers pre-pandemic, it's really a lot of people engaged in this program. Okay. Um, so volunteerism can be an incredibly powerful and impactful community engagement tool for a variety of reasons. Um, and it is a mutually beneficial experience that if managed correctly can positively affect not only the resources and your parks and programs and communities, but it really has a positive impact on the com community member themselves, the volunteer. Uh, we wanted to share with you some National Park Service conservation-based volunteer stats. Uh, these statistics are from our reporting from fiscal year 22, or last year is when we collected this data. Um, we have a few programs that are very conservation-focused in nature, and these special programs, as we call them, include uh, the National Dive Program, which had 26 volunteers who served over 1,500 hours. Uh, we had astrology volunteers, over 500 of them, who helped out and served over 11,000 hours in that year. Um, citizen science volunteers who serve in all kinds of different citizen science related roles, over 3,500 of them served over 62,000 hours. 
Then I wanted to talk a little bit about the different disciplines that we have in the Volunteers in Parks program. Um, you'll be happy to hear that natural resources volunteering is the second most popular discipline that volunteers serve in in the National Park Service. So natural resources based volunteers made up 14% of all of our NPS volunteers in fiscal year 2022. Um, this was closely following the interpretation and education disciplines, which might be what you first think of when you think of a National Park Service volunteer um, helping out with an interpretation visitor services program or um, a friendly face that you might see at a visitor center. But the conservation related, related service is just as important, even though it might be more behind the scenes. Um, and that is, once again, the second most common way that people volunteer in our agency. Um, so looking at all of the different disciplines, I wanted to give you a glimpse at the breakdown of NPS volunteer service hours across all of these disciplines. Um, looking at the last two years, you can see a glimpse at the year over year fluctuations that have occurred. Uh, we were very happy to see the 14, the increase, 14 percent increase in the natural resources volunteer service hours. We are rebuilding following the pandemic era. Um, so we are very much excited to see what the future of conservation-based volunteerism will look like. I wanted to speak to some common volunteer motivations and explain them a little bit. Um, people have a lot of different motivations and reasons for volunteering. Um, some of the most common calls to service include some kind of a personal connection to the park, um, maybe living adjacent to a park, being a neighbor. Uh, they have a a desire to simply make a difference and get out there and get involved. Um, they have spe special skills that they want to put to use or see a place where they're needed in a park or program. Uh, they want to learn. They want to build skill sets, maybe compete better for a job, um, build their reputation in a community through learning something new. They have a desire for friendship and community. You see this throughout all age range volunteers, um, but especially folks who have recently retired and might be looking to stay involved and um, make new friends. Um, they want to stay healthy mentally and physically. I'll speak to this briefly, but there is a lot of research that has shown uh, the results of volunteering on your physical and mental health as being very positive, as you can imagine. Um, they want to spend time in their favorite places. They just think it's cool to be in these parks. It's an honor. Sometimes they get park housing. There are a lot of different reasons uh, that bring them to live and, and serve in these parks. We spoke about friendships. Um, once again, that's one of the things that keeps people coming back year after year. So I wanted to share with you a few links. So Kaya, if you could share these resources in the chat, um, we can send them afterwards if needed. Um, NIH. Uh, has done a study on um, doing well by doing good. So I wanted to share that resource with you so you can dive into it more if you're interested. Uh, there are lots of other resources on the NIH.gov website that I encourage you to check out. But the main research that I wanted to refer to today is um, done by AmeriCorps. So each year, AmeriCorps uh, researches the benefits of volunteering as well as looks at the different um, individual motivations. and. Um, Reading almost directly from their website, I wanted to describe some of this to you. Uh, so they've been doing research for over two decades on this, and uh, their bod growing body of research says that volunteer volunteering provides not just social benefits, but individual health benefits as well. Um, so these volunteers often have lower mortality rates, greater functional ability, and lower rates of depression later in life than those who have not been engaged as volunteers. Um, some other findings of this research speaks to lower mortality rates, lower um, degree of, or likelihood of heart disease, um, just a lot of really positive findings. So I would encourage you to check this out. Um, you can go on the AmeriCorps website, which is nationalservice.org. So thank you, Kaya, our producer today, for sharing these links in the chat. We appreciate that. Um, you know, reflecting on some of this, why do we see this connection between volunteering and longer and healthier lives? Um, it simply has a very positive effect on a lot of social factors. Uh, you, you have a better sense of improved sense of purpose. And in turn, you know, a lot of your lifestyle habits um, support that better physical and mental health. I think it makes sense. Um, once again, would encourage you to read it, read that more and look at their website. 
Excellent. All right, for the sake of time, we're going to move forward. There's more to be um, dug into there on the AmeriCorps site. I would like to transition to our speakers. So we have a few um, excellent speakers planned for you today from the field, including staff and a volunteer. And so first up, we have Laurel McKenzie. Um, Laurel McKenzie is the lead park ranger and volunteer coordinator at Weir Farm National Historical Park. Um, she oversees a program of about 60 recurring volunteers who serve in a variety of positions. Prior to moving to Connecticut, uh, she was a park ranger at, oh gosh, I don't know if I can say this right, Haleakala, Haleakala, <laughs> Haleakala um, National Park on Maui, where she supervised astronomy volunteers. Throughout her career, Laurel has worked to help connect people to places and empower them to engage in ways that are personal and meaningful. She has a passion for science communication and interpretation, audience-centered experiences, and helping to find opportunities to make national parks more accessible to everyone. In her role at Weir Farm National Historical Park, she never ceases to be impressed by her NPS volunteers' dedication to supporting the conservation efforts and meeting challenges in creative and positive ways. So Laurel, take us away. Hi, uh, hey, thank you, Sam. Uh, and hello, everyone. I'm so excited to be here uh, and have the chance to share a little bit about Weir Farm and National Historical Park. Um, for those who don't know, we are a smaller historical park in the state of Connecticut, and uh, we like to say that we are the park for art. So a lot of our visitors come to see the historic buildings, to take part in art, um, to visit our landscapes. But the landscapes themselves encompass more than 60 acres of natural space. That's woodlands, that's wetlands, that's meadows. And what we know is the health of our natural resources within the park has an impact uh, on our surrounding forests. And so managing our natural resources is a park strategic priority. Um, and at a park that is as small as Weir Farm, uh, it is important, uh, in fact, it's essential that we have volunteers that can help us with our goal. Um, so on the first slide, that's just me, yep. <laughs> um, and uh, here we have some of our volunteers that are helping us with some uh, garden crew tasks. Um, so one volunteer opportunity I want to share with you all today is a consistent part of our park's landscape conservation goals, um, and that is the garden crew. Last year we had a crew of about 25 consistent volunteers, um, and uh, they uh, work with us to help maintain our historic gardens and grounds, but they are also a huge part in habitat restoration, um, in removing invasive species, in trail maintenance projects, um, and this also includes, as you can see, some youth volunteers as well. Um, our garden crew contributes on average about 30 hours um, every week over the course of our six month season. So they're uh, a huge part of how we get stuff done here. And without the assistance of this team, um, we would not be able to maintain the grounds to the level that we do or address the landscape conservation projects that we have in mind. Next slide. The other opportunity that I want to share with you all is something called phenology. Um, so it's an exciting thing that we're trying to expand here at Weir Farm. Um, here, here you can see that um, uh, we have some slides of what the phonology app looks like, as well as what it looks like to um, be doing phonology. But essentially, um, phonology is just the process of monitoring and documenting changes throughout seasons. So that could be when um, a bird is migrating, that could be when a plant is blooming. All of this goes into databases that are online um, and available to everyone to use. Um, and so for Weir Farm, we use Nature's Notebook, which I have screenshots of here. Um, from a broad scientific standpoint, the data helps track changing seasons and potentially climate change. Um, but the value of volunteer phenology on the ground is really immediate and it's threefold. It contributes to a substantial increase in observations and data. It improves the value of data by sharing it in a public format. And it also provides opportunities for conservation and education and engagement with our visitors who might be curious about what our phenology volunteers are doing out on the trail. So you can do the next slide, please. Um, so here, that's one of our uh, phenology volunteers in action. And these are those different seasons that I was talking about at Weir Farm. 
Um, I mentioned the phonology program is something that we are working on expanding here. Um, last year, we had about five uh, routine volunteers that came in and made about 36 um, uh, different shifts throughout the course of our season. Um, and it has been a really accessible and engaging way to get volunteers involved in conservation efforts. We've recruited about four more volunteers that are interested, and there are current volunteers who are uh, interested in joining our, our phonology program. So it's definitely something that sparks interest in our, our volunteers. Um, Phenology volunteers right now currently monitor about five plant species, um, both native and non-native, um, to get an idea of the spectrum of what's going on in our landscape. Um, and we hope to add more species this summer and also continue to expand the program um, and how long we operate it. Um, what's really great about phenology is that it also meets the needs of the volunteer. Um, a lot of our prospective volunteers like the flexibility in the schedule that we offer. They like being able to be out on the trail. Um, and they also really appreciate knowing that the data that they gather and the observations that they're making are really being used and are essential um, to making important conservation decisions. So it's really exciting to see the interest and success of volunteer programs that integrate with resource management at Weir Farm. And these programs bring home the idea that while conservation is a global issue, um, we need the local impacts and local um, action to be able to fully monitor and adapt to what's happening uh, all around us. So the support of volunteers is crucial to those efforts wherever you are. And I hope that on this webinar, you will be inspired to seek out those opportunities to empower volunteers um, and really involve them in this important work. So thank you, everyone. I look forward to the rest of the webinar. Thank you very much. Great. Um, so next up, our next speaker is Glenn. Um, so Glenn, if you can join us on camera and unmute. Thank you. Thank you so much. I can see you. That's great. Um, I want to introduce Glenn with a bio to kick things off. Glenn Tobin, a PhD, is a former business executive who we are lucky enough to have as a volunteer with the National Park Service. Um, he worked as, at an analytics company as the CEO of that company. Um, he's found a lot of passion in restoring native habitats in the lower Potomac Gorge and the Washington, D.C. metro area. The Potomac Gorge is one of the most biodiverse regions um, of the Mid-Atlantic. Glenn and other volunteers who've helped support these efforts um, in partnership with the National Park Service are working to push back rampant invasive plants that are starting to take over um, and they are seeking to give the robust ecosystems a chance to regroup and recover. After seeing strong evidence of improvement, Glenn is organizing a citizen science initiative to help measure these changes. So Glenn, thank you. Thanks a lot, um, Sam. It's uh, thanks for the opportunity to present. Also, it's really nice, nice to be here. Um, can you go to the next slide, please? As background, it's becoming clearer that national parks that are near urban areas are facing growing challenges from invasive species. In a recent article in Ecological Applications, staff from the Park Service published a study that documented wide invasive expansion in national parks over the previous 12 years. The third quote at the bottom I think is really important in that the authors conclude that even professional ecologists may be underestimating how bad the situation has become in recent years. Uh, I volunteer along the Potomac River in Virginia, just upstream of Washington, D.C. I spend 500 or so hours each year in this area that's called the Potomac Gorge. It's a steeply sloped section of the river as it flows out of the Piedmont Plateau and into the coastal plain. It has a huge variety of ecosystems and believed to be one of the most biodiverse areas in the mid-Atlantic, even though it's really tiny. Um, it hasn't been spared the devastation described in the article. The photos on the right give you some sense of it in the area I work, which is perhaps one of the worst areas in the gorge. Left unchecked, the invasives can literally destroy natural um, areas. Just a few minutes ago, Sam outlined what motivates volunteers according to the research, and I thought it might be helpful if I outlined uh, my own journey and motivations. One thing that really, um, I guess, gets me going is the impact I'm seeing from the work. This is a vignette from the beautiful area I work in. You can see on the left, a section of the park dominated by kudzu. It's like a blanket that gets thrown over the ecosystem, pushing out other plants, forming a thick monoculture. The middle photo shows what it looks like after the kudzu was treated, which is kind of an ugly sight to see. 
Um, but finally, on the right, you can see the trees recovering and a much more diverse ground layer forming. In this case, the changes were dr really dramatic and rapid, occurring in less than two years. More often, they're subtle and slow moving. Um, for example, uh, next slide, please. Um, yesterday, I saw something just astonishing. Uh, there's an imperiled species in Virginia called the white fawn lily. Um, it's related to a very common species called yellow trout lily, and the true two grow in roughly similar environments. And for years, I've been scanning flowers of trout lily uh, to try to find a white one. And yesterday, in an area that I've been working since the very beginning, seven years ago, I suddenly saw one of these. And it's not like I'm not observant. I have hundreds and hundreds of observations from this area on iNaturalist. I'm always looking for new plants. And how this one showed up here, I literally have no idea. But that one tiny plant is going to keep me going for another year or two. Um, on the other hand, last week I heard a depressing but common sentiment from a hiker who stopped to talk. After discussing what I was doing, he said, oh, well, that seems futile, but thanks for doing it. And unfortunately, that sentiment is too common. My experience shows it's also dead wrong. If you step back from the details, I think we could dramatically reduce invasives in the entire Potomac Gorge. Doing so would result in a relative proliferation of rare and unusual plants, along with a great expansion of the common natives and of insects and other organisms. And this treasure of a national feature is being degraded, but its continued decline is not inevitable. Okay, on to my, back to my motivations. Um, next slide, please. I love being outside and surrounded by nature. Uh, the volunteer work I do is also a fantastic exercise, improving stamina, strength, flexibility, and balance. I'm constantly finding new things to learn about, such as learning the needs of plants, starting out how to use map mapping software called GIS. I've researched how the river was formed, the native peoples who called this area home, the more recent history of land ownership and other topics. I've also developed a set of new friends and a community, and I get a chance to contribute locally to solving massive societal problems. It is definitely <laughs> a lot cheaper than seeing a therapist, um, and I'm certain that I've seen various mental health benefits. In short, I get back far more than what I put in. And honestly, I just, I don't know why more people who have the time don't do what I'm doing. Another important motivator for me is the ongoing partnership I have with wonderful individuals in the Park Service, many of whom have also become friends. Maintaining a partnership as a volunteer can be challenging when the NPS staff change roles. Um, I'm not sure what systematic approach the NPS uses to make sure volunteers don't get lost when staff move roles, but I do hope it's really, really robust. I've been fortunate that I've been treated with care throughout um, any change, you know, such as such as this when I've been working in the park. To the title of the slide, I think about what I do as land stewardship. I obviously work as an agent of the Park Service. It's their land. I just get the help. Um, but I'm hoping that in 50 years, my grandkids will be able to see. Could you go back a slide, please? Hoping that in 50 years, my grandkids will be able to see the results of the work. If we can shepherd the ecosystem so that they can recover, they'll also be more resilient to climate change. Could you go back one slide, please? This slide also kind of describes my journey, which began with old fashioned hard work, uh, removing invasives, mostly by myself. Um, boots and gloves were essential components along with long pants and long sleeves. Can I just confirm that I'm still presenting? I can't see the screen anymore. Oh, there we go. Um, I discovered lots of things, tools were out. I also learned to remember my water bottles in the summertime. And then since then, my journey's consistently expanded, but it still includes a lot of hand on, hands-on work. Um, shortly after I began volunteering, I realized I needed to know more. Um, that motivated me to join the uh, Virginia Master Naturalists and get some great training and meet like-minded individuals who I could learn from. My scope also expanded by bringing other volunteers in to help. Um, I met a number of trail runners 
as an example, and they've been not only cur curious, but also willing to pitch in. During the pandemic, a group of Mormon missionaries looking for public service pitched in every week and moved the work ahead by at least a year. The third point here is that I've also been permitted by the park to use herbicides, which I know is a rare thing. This helps me to make sure that what we're working on doesn't come back as quickly as it can be taken out. It also allows me to address problems that manual labor alone can't solve, like eradicating Japanese knotweed. Of course, I had to become certified by Virginia, and I operate under the licenses and direction of GWMP staff, following all state and federal rules. Um, and then for the, these last two bullets, I'd like to go to um, the next slide. So if you could um, switch the slide. A couple of years ago, in collaboration with NPS staff, we applied for and received multi-year grants to expand resources available to tackle invasive. Uh, this allows us to bring in much larger equipment to attack in particular very large expanses of kudzu. Earlier, I mentioned learning to do GIS mapping. The picture on the left shows part of the area. I created a map that divides it into workable pieces, and then we created strategies to address each piece of the area. Um, the picture on the right shows um, the, the NPS using a high pressure sprayer and a 500 foot hose to get right into the middle of the kudzu. And I should add that this uh, horrific looking scene is actually totally different today. Um, we're also closely coordinating larger herbicide application with volunteer efforts. The research calls this an integrated pest management or IPM approach. And we're using uh, volunteers to do labor intensive work, taking ivy off the trees as an example. We use park service resources to treat larger areas with herbicide. Volunteers also follow up on the herbicide treated areas to remove stragglers that would otherwise grow back. As a result, we can do different types of herbicide treatment the next time and we can cover more ground. We're seeing in vivid terms the benefits of having both activities underway. Uh, neither volunteers alone nor herbicides alone will solve the invasive problems. And here's something that that I've learned is that volunteers aren't just an additive activity to park service resources. Rather, we can make it possible to use park service resources differently and more effectively. But a different kind of joint planning is necessary to realize these types of benefits. Finally, let me talk about the last expansion of focus. And if you wouldn't mind um, flipping the slide again which is a broader citizen science effort to document progress over time. Um, in collabor collaboration with the Arlington Regional Master Naturalists, we're creating a cohort of educated volunteers to measure vegetation change over years. We're trying to create quantitative information that will help understand the impact of effort. What works? What doesn't? We're receiving wonderful support from an NPS ecologist who's helped, who helped to create the protocols and is training our volunteers. And then let me just uh, wrap it up and I'll turn it back over um, with, I think the most important observation of all, which is if we can carefully integrate volunteers and other like-minded organizations with the park service, we can achieve way more than would otherwise occur. Um, it takes care and time from the National Park Service and some dedicated volunteers, but the rewards far exceed what can be accomplished otherwise. The task of maintaining our natural areas is huge. Let's leverage every resource to make it happen. And Sam, with that, I'll turn it back over to you. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Glenn. Thank you, Glenn. Sorry, I thought I had an echo there. Apologies if I'm echoing. Uh, we really appreciate the meaningful service that you are doing um, impacting the DC region and beyond um, by educating others. Thank you. Next up, we have Lucy Hurlbut of uh, the Youth Programs Office with the National Park Service. Lucy will be speaking about youth core opportunities and how we use them as a means of um, organizations building program support to help better manage these volunteers and engage them in service. So um, Lucy, Lucy um, has been with the NPS for a while. 
Um, she works as a youth programs outreach and digital communications specialist uh, based in the Washington Service Office, Support Office, based in Washington, D.C. Lucy has a master's degree in environmental management, and her most recent job before the National Park Service was with the International Food Policy Research Institute, where she served as a, a member of the Sustainability Task Force and helped to implement a composting program for the organization to help reduce food waste. In her current role with the NPS, she highlights the great work that NPS volunteers, employees, interns, fellows, and service corps members um, are doing in a variety of ways, including through communications and program management. Um, she really loves supporting youth, and you can see that in her service, um, and she loves seeing how they continue to learn and grow throughout their lives. She'll speak a little bit more to this and about how many of these programs connect with volunteer service. So, Lucy, thank you for joining us. All right, thank you so much, Sam, and thank you for having me. So, um, on the next slide. Um, so, we are the NPS Youth Programs Division and the Experience Services Program. So, uh, what we do is we coordinate and administer various youth and young adult development programs and the Experience Services Program, which allows for temporary employment opportunities for individuals 55 years or older to work on specific project assignments. And many of these end up being volunteer service projects because they can bring their skills to help with needed projects and also mentor the youth. So one thing that I really love about my job is getting to communicate all the wonderful and amazing work that the youth and young adults uh, are doing within our programs with the National Park Service. And this is not just limited to our own office, but we will talk today about some of the ones that we do manage. Um, some of this uh, work that I do to help communicate this out is through social media, um, writing content for MPS.gov, which includes spotlight articles about our different youth and young adults and what they're doing across um, different parks and also organizing virtual events. So on the next slide, I'm going to give you a quick snapshot of what our office looks like. So currently we manage a $14.5 million fund source known as the Youth Partnership Programs uh, Service-Wide Fund Source. And these programs are designed to provide employment, education, recreational, and volunteer service opportunities for U.S. citizens and legal residents. We have a number of youth programs that we manage directly, which includes the YMCA, the Boys and Girls Clubs of America, the Girl Scouts of the United States of America, and the Boy Scouts um, of America as well. So we also have MPS Service Corps programs too, which target youth ages 15 to 30 years of age and veterans 35 years old or younger for employment opportunities. And these include the Youth Conservation Corps, also known as YCC, and um, corps that are part of the 21st Century Conservation Service Corps, which puts thousands of America's youth um, and young adults who are 16 to 30 years old and military veterans 35 years and under um, to protect and restore our America's great outdoors. So we currently have 40 youth master cooperative agreements with partners and several task agreements that fall under the master cooperative agreements. And these typically last five years and can be renewed. So I won't go into detail about these agreements, but the main point is that the difference between a cooperative agreement and a grant is the amount of involvement there is with the, uh, with the federal government. So through our cooperative agreements, we work very closely with our partners to provide these opportunities. So we really are appreciative of the partners who help us to administer the programs and really make this all happen. Um, so on the next slide, uh, we have a diverse number of programs, and these are just a few. I'm not going to name all of them because there are many of them. We do have a page that explains several of these programs in detail and where you can find out more information. Um, but one of them that I'd like to highlight is the Community Volunteer Ambassador Program, because that ties specifically with the Volunteers and Pro Parks Program, uh, which administers this in partnership with Conservation Legacy um, through their Stewards Individual Placements Program and AmeriCorps. So through the program, CVAs help national parks connect to their local communities. So if you can imagine it, our parks 
um, programs are located in all 50 states and territories, as far as Alaska, as far west as Guam, and as far south as the Caribbean. We have over 50 programs that we've funded through these opportunities, and the CVA program is one of them, and we've been very happy to have them there so that we can show the connection between volunteers and youth, because there are several youth volunteers that work in our parks. And some of the different various career fields um, that you can gain experience in include historic preservation, archaeology, communications, science, wildland fire, interpretive program, underwater exploration, uh, research, and many more. So basically anything you can imagine in the Park Service wanting to do, there's a job for you. And volunteer service is one way to start uh, to get involved through that. So on the next slide, we'll talk a bit about some of the benefits to having youth volunteer in our national parks. So we should remember that everyone has to start somewhere on their journey to becoming who they want to be and to learn more about who they are. Each experience is valuable and you never know how one experience can change your life. Even if you do something that you find you really don't like, that's still valuable and you're still learning and figuring out what you want to do and what matters to you. So on a personal note, um, one way that I actually volunteered was through my local 4-H club. And our focus was not on agricultural um, activities since I lived I live in Maryland, but we did do many other things like creating gardens, um, using power tools to build birdhouses and chairs. We volunteered at homeless shelters, packaged food for those in need, and helped out at our local farmers market. So one of the benefits to volunteering at a national park um, is gaining those student service learning hours because you're working with the community. So that is one of the requirements, but also you can also gain work experience too. It's valuable on your resume if you're looking to apply to a federal position that volunteer experience counts just as much as any paid experience that you have. So start early, as early as you can with volunteer service and just keep going and keep moving through that. So it really is an entry point into um, serving your community and your shared lands. And um, volunteering also helps you to to get um, focused um, to move into other opportunities like service core work and national service, which we know does not always have to be done outdoors. So that's one thing I also want to make a point about is that conservation, while there's a lot of work that we do outdoors, there's a lot of work behind the scenes too indoors that people are working on that help to move the conservation movement forward. So volunteering is one of those ways. Um, and um, so um, moving on to the next slide, we can see that many of our service corps work with volunteers um, support the Volunteers and Parks program. And in addition, we also have some youth programs that also help provide volunteer opportunities. So some of the ones I already had mentioned, I'll go into a little more detail here. So in 2022, our scouting partnerships with the Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts brought in almost 30,000 volunteers. So if you think of those 300,000 some volunteers um, that was mentioned at the beginning, that's that's a good um, amount of volunteers here that we're getting through our youth. And um, through those partnerships, we've had several park sites, you know, work on different activities. For instance, a Boy Scout had earned his Eagle Scout rank by helping to rebuild the Paramount Ranch at Santa Monica Mountains National Recreation Area in California. We had a Girl Scout earn her gold award by helping to install bat boxes at Charles Young Buffalo Soldiers National Monument in Wilberforce, uh, Ohio, to aid in restoring the bat population. So the Scouts don't have to be earning their gold award or Eagle Scout to be volunteering, but those are just some examples of ways that those awards uh, that you can work towards gaining those awards as well. And then for the Boys and Girls Clubs of America, uh, we've had participation in several sites, which brought over 12,000 youth. Um, an example of this was with the Boys and Girls Club of Greater New Bedford, which visited New Bedford Whaling National Historical Park to learn about the history of the whaling industry. And they also created their own zines, which are small booklets on different topics such as abolition and historic preservation. 
Uh, another one is the Youth Conservation Corps program, which is for those individuals 15 through 18 years old. And this is actually a paid opportunity. Um, and it's a unique one because it's specifically designed for high school students to learn about con conservation and get introduced um, from an earlier age. So we had approximately 400 youth participate last year and we're ante anticipating an increased number um, in the next few years. One project that they worked on, though, was a citizen science project called the Dragonfly Mercury Project. Um, and this is a nationwide study that works with citizen scientists and community volunteers to collect dragonfly larvae for mercury analysis. So that will continue this year as well. And lastly, the uh, National YMCA MPS partnership at several sites as well with over 16,000 youth. And an example of a way that a service corps would work with a youth program and volunteers is through the Student Conservation Association. They had a partnership um, with Reconstruction Era National Historical Park in Beaufort, um, South Carolina, uh, where they learned about the deep history of their town and just connecting with the local community as well. So you have the YMCA partnership with volunteering and service core work all together. Next slide. So now I'd like to, if you can keep clicking, um, uh, to see here, there are a couple of events here that we've organized, including, if you keep clicking, um, there was one that we did with the Volunteers and Parks program in November of 2021. So I encourage you, if you keep clicking one more time, um, to uh, to look at that event that was actually moderated by Sherry Orr, who is one of the speakers today. And several of the um, examples that I provided were actually some of the, the volunteers who worked on those different projects. So you can learn more about them there. We also have an upcoming event during National Park Week, which as we mentioned, National Park Week, National Volunteer Week, and Earth Month and Earth Day are all happening all at once here um, in this month. So that's going to be with the CORE Network and the National Park Foundation, and there are certainly connections there to volunteers in parks as well. So moving on to the next slide. Last but not least here, I'd just like to share a couple of photos of some of our youth and young adult programs. So from left to right, we have an American Conservation Experience Indian Youth Service Corps Traditional uh, Trades Apprent uh, Advancement Program member. It's a mouthful, but that's that's the name um, who was working at Casa Grande Ruins National Monument. And then there's a uh, Latino Heritage Initiative Program intern at Frederick um, Law Olmsted National Historic Site with some other park colleagues. We have Groundwork USA members um, working at Martin Luther King Jr. National Historical Park. Then there's the Historically Black Colleges and Universities Program through the Green and Youth Foundation and some core members at Lyndon B. Johnson National Historical Park, and then the Scientists and Parks Fellow um, at Hawaii Volcanoes National Park. And then on the next slide, you'll see we have some more examples of our actual youth um, participants. So the Boy Scout troop um, here is from Charles Young Buffalo Soldiers National Monument, and they just received their Junior Ranger badges. Then we have one here, a Girl Scout troop cleaning up a park and earning their Junior Ranger badges too. So there are different ways to volunteer, whether it's through you know, cleaning up and helping a park with that or some other specific project as well. Um, and then on the bottom, there's an SDA intern. That's the one I actually was just mentioning to you with the YMCA campers at Reconstruction Era National Historical Park and the Boys and Girls Clubs of America ones from New Bedford. That I also mentioned, and lastly, the YMCA campers who visited Vicksburg National Military Park during their spring break. So just a couple photos there to tie this all together and show you that volunteers are in our parks and we also need photos as well to show um, that they're happening here. So thank you um, for this Hello. time and please feel free to reach out to any of us with questions on how you can volunteer in our parks. I'll thank turn it back see. over to Sam. We appreciate it. We're going to keep on going here um, so we have some time left for Q&A. Um, next up, we have Nick Solomon. Um, Nick is currently acting as our service-wide volunteer program coordinator specifically for volunteer.gov, which he'll tell you a little bit more about. Um, over the past, Nick, 
past year, Nick has led the development of major improvements to this website and is with us today to speak to that. Um, he's been working hard on this with a work group and um, Nick, thank you for being with us today. Great. Thanks, Sam. Thanks for having me. So I'm going to speed through this pretty quickly because we've got limited time and I want to make sure you all have time for questions. Um, so I'm here representing volunteer.gov and really what volunteer.gov is, is it's a place where a volunteer can discover volunteer opportunities and learn about how they can make an impact in causes that they care about. They can submit their volunteer application to thousands of sites across the country, all located at federal agencies who need their time and talent to meet their mission. So um, Volunteer.gov is made up of a handful of different agencies. We partner with um, a number of other land management agencies, both within the Department of Interior, as well as those uh, outside, including the US Forest Service and the Army, US Army Corps of Engineers. Um, let me keep going on the slides, Kaya. I'm just gonna kind of speed through them. We have existed truly since 2002, but we launched a new modern version of volunteer.gov in 2020. And keep going. Uh, because of our engagement and interaction with our other federal land management agencies, um, we're able to touch and reach out to uh, a much bigger swath of volunteers than when you're really just acting within the National Park Service. Keep going. Um, so we as the National Park Service uh, own and uh, largely operate uh, volunteer.gov, but as I mentioned, um, it is in partnership alongside a number of our federal agency partners. Um, they all have a voice in what the platform looks like and what the platform does as a part of our business user group. Keep going. So what volunteer gov really does is it's a place where volunteer coordinators can post volunteer opportunities, um, provide notification to applicants, uh, gather their applications, and then track their volunteer hours. Volunteers can create a profile, search for volunteer opportunities that match their interests and availability, submit applications, and then view their volunteer hours. At least that's what it is right now. Um, we have uh, added ways that we partner with other organizations such as Volunteer Match and Idealist so that when a, a volunteer coordinator posts an opportunity on volunteer.gov, it automatically links over into Volunteer Match and Idealist. You don't have to do anything else. Um, you post it in volunteer.gov and it's gonna show up in those other two places. If somebody else finds it on those other two places, it routes them back to volunteer.gov to apply for those opportunities. We just launched that uh, the past couple of years. Um, just kind of keep going. Uh, we're really excited to share with you today that um, a few new things that we've launched. Um, we have a new newsletter that goes out to all of our volunteer coordinators, including those beyond just the National Park Service agencies, where we can keep them up to date with the latest and greatest new enhancements. Among those new enhancements, if you keep moving on the slide, um, and the most exciting one, I think, is electronic documents. We all are familiar with, or many of you may be familiar with, the uh, volunteer service agreements or the 301As that you all need to fill out. We are building functionality to take care of that built within volunteer.gov. Um, that's our most exciting thing that I'm excited to share with you all. We're looking forward to that functionality being released in mid-May. Um, I, I tell many people that my goal for volunteer.gov is really for folks to spend as little time on volunteer.gov uh, as possible to make sure that they can get through all of the required administrative pieces uh, to find the volunteer opportunity and get signed up uh, as a member of the volunteer opportunity so they can get out and do the great amazing things like the things that Glenn was talking about. I want to make sure that people are able to knock out that paperwork quickly and then have an easy space where volunteer managers can manage their volunteers um, much easier and and instead of working on dealing with a bunch of paperwork can instead get out, get out in the field and work alongside their volunteers um i came from rock creek park one of my favorite moments of my job there was working alongside my weed warriors out in the field um and so that is my aim in building these different features in volunteer.gov so that's a little bit about what we have coming there's some more stuff on this the screen that you can see there um but i will yield the rest of my time and turn it back to brian to take questions and answers Thanks, everyone. All right. Um, wow. So inspiring and fantastic and exciting and all that. 
So uh, for presenters, if you can just turn your cameras on, maybe we can take have some uh, a, Q, a quick Q and A, um, you know, five maybe ten minutes. Um, folks on the on the line, um, you can type your your questions into the chat there. Um, but I do have a couple questions to get us going. Um, Sherry, I mean, our the Park Service has a unique role uh, in voice and conservation across the country. We've got a ton of volunteers. I would assume more than even the other federal agencies or any state you know, uh, agency, uh, state level either. So we, we play a leadership role in volunteerism, right? How can we take it to the next level? I mean, obviously some parks are doing outstanding work, empowering people like Glenn, you're right at, at GW Parkway or with the Weed Warrior program at Rock Creek uh, Park. How, how can we elevate it um, to the next level and, and provide a, you know, a, 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 a leadership um, more nationally? for other uh, for others to follow. That's a great question, Brian, and I would welcome others to chime in in the chat. Um, I will say I am in the visitor center at Blue Ridge Parkway presenting something else. So I apologize for noise. Um, but I think a way that we can present a leadership voice is to truly start acting like leaders. Um, I've been noticing parks uh, raising their hands and appearing in more community events, uh, more national events, more webinars, more trainings, and presenting ourselves as examples of ways that we are getting the community engaged um, and ways that we are, are using volunteers to truly move the needle in conservation action. And so I think recognizing the space that we have, uh, Laurel did a great job of presenting even how a relatively small and historic focused park can make a huge difference in the local community in the conservation space. And so I think, again, recognizing the role that we do play in this area and owning into it um, is one way that we can truly make a difference. Um, I would welcome if there's other panelists that, that have other ways that they would recommend NPS step into that leadership role. Um, I can add something, Sherry. Um, to add to that, I would encourage people to actually also uh, participate in webinars and virtual events and in-person events, you know, when they have an opportunity to, to speak a bit about that connection, because sometimes, you know, you're working in your one area and it's sometimes more of a silo and you can see that there's a connection that volunteers hits every aspect of what we do in the park service and we could not do what we do without volunteers. So just want to say that. I think um, also to speak to that question, expanding creative opportunities like the artist in residence program and just finding new um, easy access ways for people to get involved if they don't have a lot of um, free time or don't live in close proximity to a park, uh, looking into other ways to offer easy access volunteer opportunities. Great. And kind of related, uh, Nick, I loved what you said about, you know, <laughs> helping people just get to the work, get to volunteer with alongside Glenn and actually don't spend a lot of time at volunteer.gov. Uh, um, how can that tool, um, do you think what the added improvements do you, is it anticipated across the federal agency, you know, uh, coordinators there that volunteerism will get expanded and have more of a presence possibly on like things like recreation.gov will be get a little bit more uh, TLC. Goodness, I hope so. I can already speak to the fact that we are partnering with recreation.gov uh, here in the real near future um, and it elevating the status of volunteer.gov is really one of our biggest aims, right? Um, it's kind of just been this, this little recruitment tool, but we know it can do more and we want it to do more and we want it to kind of be out there in a space so that, and we want volunteer co coordinators to know and, and our partners and our volunteers to know that, um, you know, opportunities when you post in volunteer.gov, they're going to show up in many different places and we're trying to make that easy for you to do as well. And, and not just that, but like you said, adding the additional functionality to make jobs easier right like i i want those experiences experiences to be easier so that you all can get out and do the things that I, that i can't do right i can't be the glenn going out there and eradicating all of that kudzu i need glenn to get out there sooner to eradicate more kudzu so that's that's my job so um going from nick to glenn glenn how are you 
you're like one of these super volunteers we you know we we find and and are so excited to hear from uh, in the park service i mean the role that you play is priceless right because you're providing a role model for what's possible <laughs> from engaging the public right i mean a lot of superintendents or others may not understand what is possible um so thank you I'm sure there's other super volunteers out there, right? So how do we, how, what, how are you empowered at GW Parkway? Um, they've got a lot of, uh, <laughs> they have limited staff. They have a, a lot of acreage. How, how are you empowered to do what you do? Well, that's a, a great question. I mean, I'm obviously self-motivated at, at some level, um, but I think the, thing that has been really great for me is that as I've kind of expanded my eyes over time in terms of what I might be able to lead, I've just gotten tremendous um, response from the people that I work with at the Park Service at the, at the GWMP, um, kind of encouraging me in that regard. Um, anything from presenting, I try, I tend to do a report every couple of years that outlines the work I've been doing and the and the results. Um, so the, my participations included presenting my, you know, kind of my uh, semi-annual reports to the whole leadership team of the GWMP. Um, uh, but it really comes down to just a very small number of people. Um, and so how the question is, how does the Park Service cultivate and nurture the kind of crazies like me um, to find the, the the proto crazies and kind of, you know, bring them along so that they're able to have bigger and bigger impact and kind of lead a leveraged effort that's much broader than just a person going to do something. And that's, you know, kind of my learning has been that I'm, you know, I've got a, I've got a um, relationship with the Park Service where I'm you know, building some level of an organization that's actually supporting the mission of the Park Service. And to me, that is what has been super interesting and in where I think, you know, the Park Service could probably get a lot more leverage if it was, you know, really thinking about that and how do you, how do you enable people to create organizations of volunteers to go tackle bigger and bigger problems? Great. One quick last question, super easy to answer, uh, Sherry or anyone else. Parks are have lots of priorities, you know, um, have to deal with communities and uh, various resource challenges. How do we encourage them to make volunteers and having the capacity to support volunteers, empower volunteers like Len? How do we help them understand the value and, and to make that a priority at the at the park level when they're getting pulled in so many different directions? I'll chime in first and then I welcome others to weigh in on how they think they can build that leadership support um, and that true that true uh, groundswell for the volunteer program. Um, I think I mean, Glenn was absolutely correct that this starts at the top. Uh, if leadership doesn't recognize the value of volunteers, it's really hard for our staff who are actually working more directly with the volunteers to be able to create those opportunities. Um, I think that's something that starts for the National Park Service at our headquarters quarters level, uh, know that we are all advocating for you in every meeting that we're sitting in um, and making sure that people recognize based on the stats that we have for the volunteer program and those visible impacts, what our volunteers can achieve. Um, I think it also happens at every level in the Park Service, though, so, uh, advocating for your own volunteer program, using the stats that you've collected, knowing how many people have served, knowing what projects they um, have completed and knowing the impacts those have had. Uh, Glenn's photos showing the progression over time of that volunteer project are powerful. You know, use those stories to demonstrate the impact and build the case just as you would any other project you wanted to complete um, as a way to grow support for your volunteer program. Uh, one other cool thing that we are doing in volunteer.gov uh, is actually building easier visual dashboards for you to be able to demonstrate the size and scale and complexity of your volunteer programs so that you can better demonstrate, you know, here's how many people want to volunteer, here's how many we can engage now, and here's what they're accomplishing. Um, so those are a couple of things that we're trying to work on at the at the headquarters level to make it easier. 
um, but also recognizing, again, this happens at every level in the organization. Awesome. I guess another thing that I would mention, and, and this is for us as well, it's powerful to have Glenn on as a volunteer telling his own story. Um, this is reminding me how much better we could be doing at the headquarters level and at every level level of letting our volunteers share their own stories. Um, so mm -hmm. for the National Park Service folks, I think this is a really great time for us to take advantage of the communications theme for this year is hashtag, hashtag my park story. Encourage your volunteers to share their stories and then lift those up through your communications channels. There's no better way to show the power of a volunteer experience than to have the volunteer share that experience. Thanks, Sherry. Well, thank and you I'm, again. And I'm happy to help any way I can. <laughs> Thanks, Glenn. Um, thank you again, everyone, for awesome presentation uh, and discussion and um, fantastic, exciting stuff. Um, I guess the next step is to check for everyone to go check out volunteer.gov and find a, a volunteer event right uh this month a great great month to get outside and and spend some time helping our, our public lands or or any lands uh out that are out there so thank you again everyone have a great rest of your week thank you